This week on CrossFeed. Love your cyber neighbor. The UCC reaches out to scientists. Exercised to death. An atheist pastor. And teachers talking about Jesus. Welcome, everybody, to CrossFeed News. I am Pastor Jim Butler out here in Boston, now painted black, but filled with tears, and crying, and sorrow, and mourning. You can tell how sad <laughs> I really am here. I'm just really, remember the tears of the clown? That's me right here. The smile is just painted on. So, <laughs> You know, the funny thing is... Um, All right, introduce yourself delays. before we move on. Oh, yeah, I suppose... <laughs> I'm going to change the subject. <laughs> I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Iowa doesn't even have a football team, so, you know. Um, <laughs> now, our last episode. I can tell you're actually where, from Wisconsin here, buddy. <laughs> I know some Hawkeye fans who disagree with you. <laughs> well, professional football team. Um <laughs> No, no, our our college, the Hawkeyes are all well half the teams in jail. So you know, <laughs> but uh, no, we uh, the, our last episode where we were talking about you know how the Patriots are going to win and everything that didn't actually come out. I didn't finish editing it uh-huh. until Monday, <laughs> so people must have really had a good time watching that. <laughs> Well, I was right. Number one, that it was the only. I thought it was just gonna be a three-point game. Um, and I and and I really, you know, although I wanted them to win, I wasn't feeling because what the Giants did in the last game, the San Diego Chargers and the Colts both did, and then the Giants with the you know the the same shut down Moss and do some other things that they pulled, and uh, that's what they did in the Super Bowl too. But uh, now we've added, though, uh, uh, on Eli Manning's part, what they now just call the play. It's right up there with the immaculate reception and the rest. How, I mean, if they gotten him down, that would have been the game. How they couldn't get him down up to this day, I still don't know. He doesn't know. Yeah. He said he, he couldn't <laughs> figure it out. But, oh, well, so much. Somebody asked me how I felt about it. I said, it's a game. They still got paid. So. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, we, we move on here. We move on in life. Uh, yesterday, of course, was Ash Wednesday, and um, we started uh, Lent up here. Apparently, uh, I, Iowa no longer has Ash Wednesday or something. Of, um, <laughs> Snow White Wednesday. We had to cancel services. <laughs> we, had, we just got hammered with snow, um, canceled confirmation class, canceled uh, Ash Wednesday services. I was supposed to have Bible class this morning. Canceled that. So th- it's getting back to normal now. How but, much snow did you yeah, guys been, get? Well, it's hard to say because it was drifting so much. Mm-hmm. But put it this way. Um, just walking from my house to the church, I um, I was walking through snow drifts that were past my knees. Oh, yeah. Well, but then there are other spots where, yeah. <laughs> so okay, there are other spots where it, it was just grass. So. You know, Foot to 18 inches of snow up here. That'd be um, yeah, we, you might have to cancel church Wednesday, but by Thursday morning everybody be out. Yeah, well, you know, I saw plows getting stuck. So yeah. <laughs> you guys don't know what real snow is. <laughs> I, yeah, I grew up in Wisconsin. I know all about snow. See, right now up here, they're they're, they're all remembering the blizzard of 78. That happened this weekend, 30 years ago. So everybody's having stories about that. That was the last thing that really shut this town down. But, hey, up here, a foot, foot and a half, two feet of snow, that's not considered anything. So. Yeah. But well, speaking of Lent. Lent, yes. Yeah, so I was going to say, the church has a new web twist on Lent here. Um, the Church of England, which I thought was kind of interesting. I don't think this is really original. Because uh, I've done this. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of giving things up for Lent, and uh, I was telling Dale just before we got going that I've given up um, drinking wine and beer and other alcohol for Lent, other than communion. So that's that's 
and uh, continuing my New Year's resolution to walk two and a half miles five days, six days a week. Uh, so um, and, and keeping that too. So uh, those two things are going to continue. But um, they suggest you uh, take something up. Uh, go a day without gossiping. Leave a thank you note for your postman. Uh, more adventurers can spend the day trying to exist on one pound forty pence. Uh, what half the world's population has to spend each day. Um, find about volunteering in a prison. Sorry. Have you ever been in a in a Turkish prison? No, this is a really cool idea. It's yeah. funny because right, uh, right after or right before actually, I saw this article. I was listening to another podcast, which I highly recommend. It's called the Super Average Podcast. Um, and if if anybody's ever heard of the Geeks and God podcast, it's the same two guys plus uh, their pastor and another pastor from out in Denver. And um, and it, it talks. It's just four guys talking about um, talking about living life as a Christian. Very cool. Superaveragepodcast.com. But anyway, they were talking about taking something up for Lent. So it was, it was kind of funny that they mentioned that right before I saw this article. And, um, and what they were talking about is like, take up Bible reading. Mm-hmm. You know, it was pick up a good habit and, um, and actually keep that habit and, instead of, um, I have a friend of mine. He every year he tries to read through the Bible, uh, the New Testament during Lent. You know, four days when he reads through the entire reads through the entire New Testament. I'm uh, I've often my last church I'd often told people, you know, instead of giving something up for life, why don't you try picking, doing something, you know, positive to change your life? Uh, mm-hmm. reading more devotions, um, or something else. Uh, another thing I like to do during Lent, um, is uh, I often will uh, fast uh, one night a week. And my wife and I will, and then we'll take that money that we would spend normally spending that meal and give it to um, food for the poor or a group like that. Okay, well, that's a neat idea. Yeah. Oh, we got uh, Archbishop Williams up there. Well, it was his idea, so. <laughs> yeah. But I love the name of this. Pictures. Uh, love life, live Lent. What a cool a theme! I like that. Yeah, I I, I kind of like the idea of. Uh, I'm a you know I'm a big fan of of using the internet to uh, get the word out to people, um, obviously. Uh, so you know they're talking about using social networking sites and blogs and websites uh, to spread the message. So we're using a podcast to spread the message. Mm-hmm. Um, Even though and, we're Lutheran, uh, we're not Church of England. We we still think this is yeah, a cool idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they have a corner on being kind to your neighbor. <laughs> It didn't originate with them. Well, well we've so. had our questions about stuff going on in the Anglican communion on this podcast, so it's nice to be able to say... To have some good news. Good news from the C of E. Yeah, All right. there is. So, and they're going to use uh, Facebook and MySpace and uh, Flickr. So, assuming that you know Microsoft doesn't buy out Yahoo, which owns Flickr, and is going to shut them down. <laughs> or <laughs> royally mess it up. So we'll see about that. But uh, it says, last Christmas, more than 2,500 Facebook users downloaded a special Church of England application to send virtual Christmas cards to their friends. And organizers of the new campaign hope it will attract thousands more to take part. So I, I think it's a really cool idea. And I really would encourage, I mean, any of those suggestions that they've got. I'll tell you what, volunteering in the jails. I was up there again last Friday and uh, the Dedham County Jail. And I want to tell you. Jail ministry is really cool, but it is not for the faint of heart. It, uh, you can, they're rough people, uh, but, uh, they're really interesting people. They really are. And a lot of them, um, they, they, they come to this point and they're just looking for something. And, uh, but the hard part is for a lot of these guys is they get out. And now how do I connect to a church? How do I connect to uh, a Christian group? How do I connect to you know, what do I do now? And it's the neat thing is that you can already be building a connection before they get out to a local congregation yeah. through some that kind of volunteering. It makes a big difference. Uh, there was a church in uh, Springfield that was had a wonderful Bible or uh, jail ministry, lots of Bible studies, and it was a black church. And unfortunately, a lot of the people in the jail were black. Um, but then it just gave them a very natural place to go when they got out. 
and uh, yeah, would that's great. Encourage them. So, but seeing that one, I would really encourage that. So that is a really cool use of the web. Then we have our friends at the United Church of Christ. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, man, it seems like every time they do an ad campaign, it's scandalous. Or it's just what's up with that? And this one, well, it's a, you know, God still speaking. You know, um, God has you know spoken His word. I don't think so. Anyway, they're trying to mend the millennium-old feud between religion and science. We want to move the church to the place where its public image, public witness, and public identity is a community of faith that is eager to engage science and welcome and honor scientists. I have no idea what that meant. Where have these people been for the last 500 years? <laughs> yes. You know, we're sorry that the church alienated people like Isaac Newton and Gregor Mendel. And, man, this sounds like, what was that, last week, week before, or something, yeah, like, something that. like that? <laughs> <laughs> oh man and uh, you know it says uh, frankly when it comes to persons engaged in scientific inquiry geneticists mathematicians chemists engineers science teachers and students the church has a history of communicating disinterest distrust and even hostility well what mathematicians have ever been uh, ousted by the church or ridiculed I was trying to Pascal. figure that one out Oh, yeah, yeah. Pat, oh, no, no, not him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I saw that. Yeah, this, 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 um, um, mathematicians. Um, the woman who has a good chance of becoming president of my congregation is a, um, professor of mathematics at Tufts University. You know, so I'm sure she feels very, and her dad is a, um, LCMS chaplain. And pastor, so I think she feels very, you know, disengaged in the church, and, you know, very yeah. put out by it. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at this thing. Ge geneticist. Do, they do know that the head of the Human Genome Project is a very committed Christian. <laughs> Can't remember his you name. Know, I mean, but... the, the the only geneticist that that Christians would have a problem with would be people who are into like cloning and and stuff like that. You know, human cloning especially. All right. So, um, you know. It, it, Engineers. They tend to. This is the thing is, this is. The, well, it's, you know, it's the <laughs> these bridge builders. I guess, you know, uh, Christians uh, always use terms like bridge building and, you know, and and it's sort of offensive to engineers who build real bridges. Okay, that's it. I just, I just looked at that and I go, <laughs> now I'm not. My vicarage church was in Denver. I mean, we had more engineers in that congregation, of course, especially mining engineers that I knew what to do with. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, I just look at this guy. Okay, granted, some of the far right wing churches might be this way. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, sometimes we do have our struggles in terms of, uh, the age of the earth. Um, you know, in, which last week we talked about intelligent design, which, by the way, if you cut our uh, uh, video on YouTube, you you guys are having a real good discussion about that on YouTube. I'll tell you, I'm looking through that. And you guys, man, we're getting that's a pretty good discussion too. Yeah, they they're really going. It's, it's actually you. mostly just two people. Okay, but those two are having a good talk yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah, it's interesting. Go go check it out. It's over at YouTube. Just look for our last episode up there. Yeah, but again, while it, you know, maybe a, uh, some, some far right fundamentalist churches, but I think the majority of, of churches, you know, engage science. Um, yeah. And gladly. We, 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 you know, we've talked about this so many times. When you become a Christian, don't check your brain at the door, you know, and, but the thing is, this is a UCC ad campaign. And, and I, okay, I'm going to make a blanket statement about blanket statements, okay? So it's going to sound a little bit hypocritical. But the um, 
you look at some of the other UCC ad campaigns they've had, there have been, and the the most recent one that springs to mind besides this one is the one where it showed the bouncers outside the church that said, we don't kick anybody out or something like that. All right. That was about a year ago. And mm-hmm. and it was this that same kind of thing. It was, it was well, we don't kick it. You know, the, the implication was, well, you know, every other church will is going to kick you. I've never known a church that would kick somebody out because they're struggling with sin. You know, it, it'd be one thing if if it's if they're um embracing sin. Well, we're going to have something to say about that, but we're not going to kick people out. We're not going to have, you know, we're not going to say, "Well, nope, you're not allowed to come and worship." But um of course the UCC so, is a- But it was these sort of this this these sort of the they're they're feeding off of stereotypes is what they're doing. Oh yeah, but definitely, definitely. They're the open-minded group, and everybody else is closed-minded in this. Um, of course, the UCC is kind of interesting. This is 1.2 million. It is a dying denomination. It is probably dying faster than almost mm-hmm. anything out there. Matter of fact, the oldest church in Springfield, Massachusetts, my my, my old hometown, old first church downtown, a building that was. It founded in sixteen hundreds. The church was found the church was founded in the sixteen hundreds. Um and the, the building they were in was, was built in the eighteen hundreds. Uh closed down. It, of course it he, he, uh hosted the gay men's course for Springfield. Uh, they uh you know um, the pastor of the church told me he was a proto Unitarian. And I asked him what that meant, and he said, uh, it means, I think Jesus should be honored, but just not sure about worshiping him or this God stuff with him. Oh, good grief. Is it the old uh, UCC, Unitarians Considering Christ? Apparently. Hey, I'm the only UCC. So, I didn't apologies to... Hey, I met another UCC pastor who told me he was a deist. And... Um, he was an interim pastor, and his uh, he was in the mid fifties. And the the par- parishioners came up to him. His his grandson was going to have surgery, and uh, he said, "Well, pastor, shouldn't we have a prayer for your grandson today?" And his response, "Well, to who and for what?" Yeah, but at the same time, because <laughs> the UCC is so. Um, broad in what they allow and accept, uh, you've got, I mean, our local UCC pastor is practically, I mean, he reminds me a lot more of a Missouri Synod Lutheran, uh, minus the sacraments. Um, but, I mean, he's, uh, otherwise, he's very conservative, very scriptural. I mean, you know, that's the problem is you go into any given UCC church, you never know what you're going to get. You know, we which, had one up here who, uh, his for me, were about, the whole uh, point of having a denomination right. is to have, um, looks like we're getting a little bit of delay, by the way. Yeah. Um, but the, the whole point of having a denomination is so that when you go to a church, you know what they're going to teach there. And so you find a church that teaches what you believe. Um, with the UCC, I mean, it's the basically the official teaching is anything goes. Absolutely. Uh, I had a friend of mine, and she was looking for a church. She went to a UCC congregation, and the sermon was why you should join a union. Um, and then up here, we had a guy up here, and his sermons were um, about why you should support the Sandinistas. This was back in the you know late 80s, early 90s. And it's just... Oh, and then there was the woman pastor who replaced the deist I just talked about. She was an evangelical. She was very conservative in her, in her theology. Uh, and see, you know, Dale and I are part of a, a church body that um, does not ordain women. Yep. And I really had the fig- tra- hardest time figuring out. So, which is better, the male deist or the female pastor <laughs> or the female evangelical? Oh. 
Yeah, there's that. I mean, there's, I guess, I don't know. I guess there's something to be said. And this is, I suppose this is our bias. Um, that there's something to be said for, uh, being part of a confessional church body. That is a church body that says, this is what we believe. Period. Uh, at least you know what you're going to get. Right. And if you, we, we, okay. Well, you see my little picture down there. You got me looking at this nice little box here. Um, and we've got room inside that box. There's going to be some differing of opinion here and there. Um, but we do have some parameters that we, 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 we keep ourselves within in terms of our confession. You know, it's not like the Baptists. You know, you get four Baptists together, you get five opinions. Um, you know, but we have our diversity. And, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, issues on worship. We have issues on... Uh, where we feel comfortable in serving. We have issues on, on who does commune, although, you know, we, you know, we, we try to keep what we call a close communion practice. Some guys are a little bit more open, some guys a little bit less. I mean, so there is some diversity, but it's not to the extent of the UCC or the Church of England or another group. You're only here because you're the best of the best. But still, I, I tell you, this, this, this whole, it, this whole initiative just really bugs me. It's the church of do what you want to. Yeah. This, this initiative they've got just bugs me. Because it acts as though, you know, they're the only ones who have a support for scientists in their church. Let's, uh, let's stop because I think we're hitting about a 10 second delay now. Let's try it. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Okay. Not too That's bad. That's not quite as bad. It must have caught up. It yeah, must have. Although, we've got little lines going through your picture over here. So, really? But it's, Looks yeah, okay it's, from here. Yeah, it's clearing up, but it's clearing up. Yeah, 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 you're a little blurry there, but it's clearing up a little bit. Okay. This is just a signal to me when I'm editing, so I know to chop this little part out. <laughs> Well, where should we go from here, my friend? Um, well, uh, you talked about um, uh, pastors who are uh, Unitarians or deists. How about a pastor who's an atheist? Or, oh, in this case, a, a former atheist. This uh, is another very cool story. This was an awesome story. I really like reading this one. So I've done the background of the guy, stories. Why don't you do the background on this one? Okay. Uh, his name is Dale Stevenson, and he's in Melbourne in Australia. All right. Um, he was a young, secular Aussie, Australian, and, um, and he liked to torment Christians. And he'd pick on them. He looked at... Uh, he looked at the way they lived. He looked at the, in the United States. It, it con- he says it confirmed my bias that their faith didn't change their lifestyle, um, which, quite frankly, is a major indictment of us as Christians um, because he's right. That's a problem. Um, but uh, he's, he says, um, I had a 100 reasons why there could not be a God, and I shared them. I'd ask... You say you live by the Bible. How do you know that some old guy didn't sit down at the weekend with a keg of beer and write it as a joke? And most didn't have a response. He was a little confused there. He was thinking of Joseph Smith. But <laughs> sorry. Well, the sad part is, is that apparently they were so intellectually shallow they couldn't challenge something like that. Right. Now, these are the people that the UCC should be targeting. The, the people that have checked their brains at the door. Because, I mean, how do we know? I mean, let's just answer that question so that anybody who's watching this, you have the answer to that question. All right? All right. Three simple words. Dead Sea Scrolls. All right? To start out with. Those were, you know, okay, how do we know that, that the Old Testament was written um, before Jesus came along and that it wasn't written afterward so that you could say, oh, look at all the prophecies that were fulfilled, you know, because the Dead Sea Scrolls are dated to around 200 B.C. And um, and that, and then you start looking at all the archaeological evidence that supports almost every event in the Bible. There's archaeological evidence that corroborates it. 
Yeah, there's some of it. And even some of the stuff that was formerly questioned, such as Kathleen Kenyon's uh, dig of uh, Jericho, which she said didn't show a, a sudden fall. Uh, now that the, the question is, eh, maybe it does. So, yeah, mm-hmm. we can answer that question. But continue with uh, Mr. Stevenson here. Okay. Um, so he says uh, whether he'd... Uh, one, later, a Christian friend challenged him about whether he'd read the Bible. I said, of course not. And he said, you wouldn't have an opinion about a political party you've never read about. He basically pointed out that I was an ignorant bigot. I love that. So he opened... I, I know. I, th- I was great. Because, man, how many people that don't really know what Christianity is about love to ridicule it? Mm-hmm. You know, that's the same thing we're talking about science. The same thing that we're... Um, People look at either intelligent design or um, or creationism or both, and just ridicule it and attack it, not knowing anything about it. You know, and 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 the thing is, this is why I tell the kids in my confirmation class when they say, "All right, you know, we're talking about creation and stuff," and then they're teaching evolution in the schools. What do we do? I said, "You better know what they're teaching you, not only out of respect for your teacher, but because." If if somebody comes and they're going to argue with you about it, you better be prepared to know what they're going to say, what they're talking about, what they know, so that you know how to answer it. Otherwise, they're going to ask you a question, and you're not going to be able to answer it because you don't know what they're talking about. But So, you know, the same thing goes with Christianity. Here. here we see, I think, a friend of mine, I don't know if Luther actually said it, a friend of mine did that. Luther once said, you, you defend God like you defend a lion, open the door and get out of the way. You know, and we know God works through the word. And so here's this guy saying, what? You know, you, you don't believe it? You know, you've read, you, you, you know, you, you've read it, haven't you? Well, no, I wouldn't do that. But read it. Find it out for yourself. And as a, in many other cases, I can think three or four other cases offhand, where somebody was started now as an atheist and started reading it, and he says he started reading the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, everything's vanity. And he's like, man, this is my life. This guy's speaking for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh, it, says it spoke straight to his experience. Yeah. I love it. I, and, I didn't even and, want to I call mean, it was a major a crisis Christian. for him. What? Dude, we're in trouble. It was a crisis. I mean, he was, uh, he found himself like, yeah, like you were just reading. I, I didn't want to call myself a Christian. I've been anti for so long, um, so I called myself a follower of Jesus. <laughs> this he reminds is great. me a little bit of C.S. Lewis. You know, Lewis was an atheist. Yeah. And uh, if you ever read his um, his uh, uh, testimony, Surprised by Joy, and he often says that uh, he was dragged kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. Run for your lives! Run for your lives! <laughs> Yeah, which you know, and that really just hits on what uh, what what being a sinner is all about. I mean, in a sense, we all are. It's just some of it experience it differently. But as sinners, so, you know, we're turned away from God, and it's only by His Word, by Him speaking to us, that you know, all of a sudden, oh, oh, yeah, hey, it's not that there's just a little bit of truth to this. It's this is the truth. This is reality. Whoa, you know, it's a big deal. And here's how God speaks. It's really cool that, I mean, you know, out so, of reading that, he, he wound up, you know, changing, and then he um, felt that God wanted him to become a pastor, and two weeks later, he got a, um, uh, you know, he got a call from a senior pastor about taking up the role, and so off he is then in this uh, Crossway Church with 5,000 members and a staff of 80. So, large congregation. Branches church. in Moreland, Craigburn, Crowburn, and four Asian congregations. Speaking Korean, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Indonesian. Impressive. What a, what a congregation. Yeah. I'll bet he's got a powerful message, too. I bet he does. And? I mean, this is a guy that, I mean, he knows what he believes. He knows why he believes it. All right, and the other thing I think is is this church which is an evangelical church, also really pushes, um, you know, social justice. Uh, you know, the church needs to, dis- to rediscover social confidence and social conscience. 
It's good to see the church with its sleeves rolled up getting involved in the local community, which probably goes back to what he saw in the United States, where he said, you know, I saw these Christians and it didn't affect their life at all. I think we're in trouble. And, uh, yep. man, I read things like that, and I, I've, I've shared it before on this podcast, you know, God's words in Romans, Paul's words, you know, your name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Yeah. On the other hand, you could always start passing out pamphlets about and tracts about Jesus in your classroom. You can show this has an effect in your life. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to do it. This is like a forwarded email. That I mean, I've, I've seen this passed around. Uh, this is up in Vermont in Irisburg. Uh, we have a couple of parents, Mel Downs and Robert Voitil, uh, who pulled their daughters out of school after teacher Wally Rogers encouraged a discussion about media reports on his keeping religious literature in the classroom and handing out a pamphlet titled, Why Jesus is Better Than Santa Claus. Now, I've seen this I mean, I've, I saw this in an email probably 10 years ago, you know. I mean, but uh, he's handing this out in class in a public school. And then they said their daughter was uh, harassed by other students, and, and Rogers did nothing to stop it. So um, it says the two are having trouble drumming up support in the community. No other parents have come forward to complain about Roger's methods. One parent who did not wish to be identified said that all the media attention is making a mountain out of a molehill. I don't know. I, th- I think I would I have to kind of side with the parents on this one. Right. I, I mean, unless this had, unless, you know, how does this tie in with what he's charged to teach? I mean, this isn't a question of evangelism. This is a question of vocation. You know, it is not his job to be distributing this kind of material. It's his job to be teaching the kids. Do your job, buddy. You know, now if you find yourself in a in a different situation where somebody's asking you a question about something, you want to answer that question, fine. All right. And and I I do believe that it is a teacher's prerogative, if asked, to express their faith or if they want to have a you know, a, a I don't know, picture of Jesus on their desk or, or something like that, fine you know, along with their picture of their family, okay? But when, uh, you know, when they're handing out (laughs) forwarded emails that compare Jesus and Santa Claus, unless you can show me how this has something to do with your class, uh, I'd say it's not appropriate. I mean, any more than handing out math assignments in a, or, you know, in in an English class would be appropriate, you know? It's, it's not even a question of whether religious literature is appropriate. It's a question of what are you supposed to be doing as a teacher? You're supposed to be teaching your class, teaching the subject that you're charged to teach. Right. Well, I, I would go the other way. I mean, if he passed out uh, in science class something that said, while evolution is right and creation is wrong, you know, I would have an objection right. to that. But that's, that's, you know, you're, you, this is going outside your field right now. You know, right. or uh, there th- th- can be a lot of ways in positive and negative. And I know we're going to have some people get them sitting there going, but he's a Christian. This is, you know, we need, you know, and, and we need God in the school. God, God, God. And I understand that, that viewpoint. I really do. I don't mean to, by saying that to be insulting at all. But mm-hmm. what if the guy was Muslim? And, you know, 20 reasons why Muhammad is better than Santa Claus. Or what if he was a Hindu? Um, right. you know, and then people would be up in arms. Right. And so that's, that's, what's really interesting to me, partly knowing Vermont, is the fact that the people don't really care. <laughs> they're, they're having yeah. trouble getting any support. And, uh, because Vermont's kind of a secular, I mean, it's the only, you know, and it's the only state in the union I think it's got a, you know, outspoken socialist for a, Representative, you know, so it's, it's it's a rather liberal area, so it kind of surprises me that you know nobody's really just jumping up and down on this one. Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at Vermont, and you know, I think about the the companies in Vermont that I'm aware of. Right, you've got uh, 
uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, aren't they? Vermont. Good stuff. Good ice cream. Still Vermont. Very good ice cream. Sure, sure, but extremely liberal organization. All right. Uh, you've got Small Dog Electronics, which is a great place to buy Macintosh computers and stuff. But you read their uh, their CEO or or whatever he is, president. Um, read his blog sometime, and he's very outspoken liberal. You know, and 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 it's like, man, why don't you just stick with selling computers? Talk about. You know, talk about Apple. Stop talking politics and, you know, gay rights and all this kind of stuff. Like, what does this have to do with computers? But, um, but I mean, yeah, it's. Vermont is also absolutely gorgeous, especially in the spring. I mean, especially in the summer. Uh, the people who like to ski like it in the winter, too, fine, too. And in still Vermont, we have the Trap Family Lodge, which is where Maria and Georg and all those guys went to after they escaped in the Sound of Music. And uh, I actually met um, the youngest of the Von Trapp children, who's now, who at the time was like 85 years old. My wife actually had a pair of pictures taken with her. Hmm. Cool. So, uh, so, so, so that's, yeah, no, that's, you know, that's, that's Vermont's other claim to fame. So, you know, it's very devout. It's, you know, and it, it's, and it, you know it's, it's nothing against Vermont or anything either. You know, it's just, it's just the fact that, that yeah, I agree. That this is happening in Vermont and nobody's doing anything about it. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, man, I figured this guy'd be fired by now. Yeah. Um, so, so, but but you and I both we both agree that, that this is probably not appropriate for a classroom. Um, mm-hmm. Again, if yeah. No, if it were a Christian school, oh yeah, maybe. But be, no, if it was a Christian but, school, but even then, yeah. it's. I mean, something like this. I I could think of so much better things. To um, you know, if you're gonna hand out something, this is this is like those those cranky cra- This is you know what this is this is uh, uh, keep Christ in Christmas or else. I mean that's basically what that that whole right. um, message yeah, is. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. it's like uh, dude, that's not what Christmas is all about. On know? the other hand, I don't mind the fact that he says he keeps religious literature in the classroom. I think that's fine. You know, I mean, that, you know, depending what, how, depending on what, you know, what it is, it could be, you know, well worth time to read, you know, kids reading. Um, sure. It doesn't say how, okay, um, it depicts a middle school. So we're talking sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So it might be at a, um, a proper, t- you know, so depending, it, it may, hopefully it would be, you know, appropriate and everything. Uh, but it's interesting. He said he didn't really answer anything. The school is warm and friendly with a great atmosphere. The staff, parents, students are wonderful. <laughs> so apparently, well, they're upset about it. Not too many people are, and uh, his job's not at risk or anything. So. No. But, so, uh, but well, you know somebody what? Somebody did lose his job. Job, though. yeah. <laughs> That's a good segue. <laughs> And this is a little more serious. If your teacher's doing this, then there's a problem. <laughs> no matter how conservative your community is. Everyone's going, what are they laughing about? <laughs> Bucharest, Romania. Uh, they're a... Uh, Daniel Corrigenu uh, and four oh, nuns... glad you pronounced his name. ...were um, convicted of murdering a young name, young nun by the name of Irina Kors- Kornicki, Kornicki? Kornici. Kornici? Yeah, probably Kornici, uh, who died during an exorcism ritual when she was bound, chained to a cross, and denied food and water for days. Yeah, she was 23 years old. She died from dehydration, exhaustion, and suffocation. Um, <laughs> says the Orthodox Church... In Romania, it prompted them to uh, promise reforms and psychological tests to screen potential clergy. <laughs> Good plan. Yeah. Um, Kornichi had been previously treated for schizophrenia and believed she heard the devil talking to her. So he and the four nuns decided to try an exorcism ritual in June of 05 using techniques that the Romanian Orthodox Church condemned as abominable. 
Yeah, I, I, I'd call him that. I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty descriptive word for what he did. Yep. Um, yeah, he and four nuns were uh, defrocked. Uh, uh, well, he was defrocked, and uh, the four nuns were excommunicated, and they all got five- and six-year jail terms. The really weird thing is that he said this guy uh, dropped out halfway through training for the priesthood and still served with the priest for the secluded Holy Trinity convent because of a shortage of suitable candidates for convents and monasteries. <laughs> so we're not going to inflict him upon the church, but we'll inflict him on all these women instead. Good plan. <laughs> He's... <laughs> He's unsuitable for the priesthood, so why don't you go live with these nuns? You yeah. tell what the church th- thinks about the nuns. It's a scary looking dude, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, I, you know, I, I was thinking either that or um, he, when he gets out of jail, uh, he could uh, go and uh, join ZZ Top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a possibility. Or actually, the thing, you know who he reminds me of? R- remember, um, oh, it was a number of episodes back we were talking about Odinism, Asatru, right? And there was that that guy from YouTube sent us that video of those that Odinist heavy metal band. This guy looks like he would fit right in with that. <laughs> I'm just, you know, picture him doing this. <laughs> Except when he started trying to do exorcisms with all of them. That would be a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it made for an interesting stage show, though. I, I mean, <laughs> this, of course, is always kind of brought up in my mind. Um, yeah. What is the line between demon possession and mental illness? You know, well, I mean, you know, a lot of psychologists, going back to science earlier, a lot of, you know, psychologists would say, well, they called the demon possession, but it was just mental illness. You know, there was no such thing as mental illness, as demon possession in the Bible. They were just mentally ill. Uh, and yet, you know, scripture says, you know, they were possessed by demons and they recognized that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I wonder, you know, and I mean, if, I think she was schizophrenic. I'm wondering if he might have been possessed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's something that um, I've mentioned on the show before. I think that uh, the that the movie The Exorcist was actually loosely based on a true story, and um, and it was something that happened uh, down in St. Louis um, at the seminary that Jim and I attended. Um, not at the seminary, but they the professors there were involved in in it, and. Um, they, I mean, they actually had the little boy um, at the seminary uh, trying to figure out what to do and stuff. Uh, Lutherans aren't really well versed in exorcism; it's just not one of our specialties. Um, uh, it's not his baptized. either. <laughs> but <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but um, you know. They were, this kid was in the hospital and the doctors were at a loss what to do with them. I mean, and, you know, they had a good understanding of what mental illness and stuff was. But, you know, when his mattress started floating and, uh, you know, all this, this weird stuff was going on, I mean, they brought in, uh, different things to measure magnetism and, and, and you name it to try and come up with, uh, a, a sort of natural explanation for this phenomenon that they were experiencing. And, I mean, there was stuff like words appearing in his skin, numbers, and, and, and stuff like that. They'd ask questions. He'd roll up his, his pant leg, and the answer to the question would appear on his leg. I mean, really bizarre, creepy stuff going on. And, I mean, this is this is documented stuff. I'm not making this up. All right. That kind of stuff. Thank you, Dave. I'm sorry. sorry. That's not mental illness. All right. <laughs> Dave Barry's famous quote. I am Sorry, not I missed that reference. Oh. oh, that's right. It's been a long time since I've read Dave Barry. But, um, yeah, yeah, you got this kind of real bizarre. Okay, yeah, that can. But sometimes I wonder. Sometimes I wonder if people who, you know, especially people, you know, who, well, like this guy, seriously. I mean, that he would subject this young girl to this and, you'd, you know, she would die from it. 
uh, and some other people that, you know, they, she would subject them to such evil things. Right. So, but I feel, I sorry, feel, feel sorry for her. I feel sorry for her family. Uh, their faith must be terribly shaken. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just, I mean, and this is, this is not the Romanian, well, okay. The Romanian Orthodox Church is to blame for sticking this guy there in the first place. But it's important to note that what he was doing was not the accepted practice. I mean, they, as soon as they found out about it, they denounced it, but the problem was it was too late. This guy was out in the boonies somewhere. It's kind of sad that, again, you know, on the one hand, we have, you know, the story of the atheist who became Christian and, and all this really cool stuff happens as, as he learned, you know, what God is all about. And on the other hand, we have this guy in the name of Jesus, you know, probably turning people off. Oh, yeah. And destroying their faith. So it's kind of painful. Uh, well, the problem is people do things in the name of Jesus that are things that Jesus would not have us do. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, any time that you're you're doing something in the name of Jesus and saying that, um, you know, I'm doing this as a as a Christian activity, um, you know, you you always have to ask, all right, is this really Christian? Is this something? You know, nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to chain people to a cross and and deprive them of food and water. It's just not there. What well, was so, like uh, back in the eighties? Uh, the one guy down in uh, Florida, you know, shot the uh, uh, the doctor who uh, did abortions. You know, and you know, God went. Sure. I, I I I read an interview with him. God wanted me to do this. This was a holy thing. He was killing children. Sorry, buddy. God doesn't give you that right. Uh, you know, and you nope. know. I don't know if you ever talk to your mom when you're growing up, but two wrongs don't make a right. And, uh, although two rights do make a lot. And, uh, so, you know, here we're, same thing. Three rights. Oh, three rights make a lot. Okay. You know, I think we better end this podcast before we get any goofier tonight. Uh, maybe you need to set us right. We have gotten some really neat comments this week. I had one, one person commiserate that my team lost, although he said he was rooting for the Giants. So, uh, another person sent us a link. I don't know if you've been able to see it yet. I've, uh, um, I, I, I saw it come in, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. We record this on Thursday, and this just came in this morning. Right, and, and it was, it was uh, I noticed the video is like 53 minutes or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'd like I just to, didn't have time to look at watch it. it. But, but he said he loved the, he loves the podcast. And uh, so it's always good to hear from fans. Always good to hear criticism, too, as well. But uh, and yeah. uh, we've had this really neat discussion on YouTube this week as well uh, about intelligent design. Maybe you've got comments about what we did, about comments about intelligent design. Uh, maybe you want to laugh at me and my team losing. Uh, whatever happens mm -hmm. to be on your mind, uh, you can get all of us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or if you're watching this on iTunes, you can click that right on. Or if you're watching in Google, you can put a con uh, YouTube on YouTube. You can put a little or River, comment or it. any of the other ones. So, so just put a comment um, right there. And 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 also uh, speaking of that reminder that if you are watching this on Google or or, or Google Video or Rev or YouTube or one of those other ones, this is available as a podcast. And the quality um, by it not converting it to Flash, the quality is a little better. And in fact, I actually there are two versions of this go out. Because usually it's bigger than 100 megs, and most of those sites limit to 100 megs. So what I do is actually, um, it, it gets once I'm done with all the editing, I produce two versions of it. The podcast version, uh, and we're talking about the video, um, because some of you are listening in audio too. There is an audio version, and uh, the 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 podcast version has a higher quality video than what goes out to YouTube and Rever and all those. So um, so I would recommend, and you can also go to our website, crossfeednews.com, and uh, if you go to the podcast page there, uh, you can watch it right if you, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't have podcast software, um, you can just watch it right at the website. And um, also, speaking of getting a hold of us, you can also call our voicemail line at 206-350-4749. We'd love to hear from you. 
And uh, oh, and there was also I have to before we close I have to um, mention this because uh, just just uh, came out today that uh, there we had had a comment about a story a year old story about Mitt Romney being a Mormon, and he threw in the towel today. Yes. So. The minister is um, gone. Yep. So looks like McCain's going to get it. Yeah, I think it brought. Actually, I was just reading a very interesting book up here about Massachusetts called The Blue Estate. If you want to see what I put up with it in Massachusetts, John Keller's book, The Blue Estate, it really is very good. But it, it's kind of, it was kind of interesting because I had interviews with him. And, you know, as governor, and I'd forgotten about this, he accepted no pay for four years. Hmm. He, he, yeah, he, would, he, he, he did the job for four years, never got a dime for it. He, uh, you know, he was driven around in a cattle, you know, your basic Cadillac, you know, was, was nice, but wasn't real fancy. Um, said, um, uh, he, um, Massachusetts is a horrible patronage state. Okay. I mean, you know, if you got, if you know somebody who's in the legislature, you'll get a, you'll get a state job and be set for life. They used to have more, uh, Elevator operators, and they had elevators in the state house. I mean, you know, just that kind of place. Um, he 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 wouldn't do that. He uh, tried to dismantle. It's one reason that the legislature hated him because he tried to purge all the patronage patronage out. Um, judges, he's picked people who were he thought were qualified from either party. Instead of some old college buddy who was out of a job. Uh, <laughs> So uh, he really wasn't a bad governor from Massachusetts. You know, I've forgotten a lot of that about him because uh, the last two years he was just wasn't interested in looking for president. So, uh, yeah, but it's the Midster's gone. Shout out to PDAPerformance.com. We thank them for uh, taking care of our hosting and bandwidth. Really appreciate it. They make this possible. Yes. And you make it possible because you spend the time watching, which we do appreciate. Mm -hmm. We will see you next week at the uh, after our first full week of Lent. I uh, pray that you have a very penitential and uh, moving Lenten season. Yep. And hopefully we won't have any more snow to have to cancel Lenten services. Hopefully not. So. And we'll talk Good to night you Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. God bless.